Welcome to the fifth section of our unit on geometric optics. In this section, we're going to talk about the index of refraction. And really what we're doing here is we're moving from the world of mirrors and reflection into the world of refraction and lenses. And in order to do that, the first thing I need to do is introduce to you the index of refraction. The index of refraction is a number used to characterize a medium. The bigger the number it is, the slower light or electromagnetic waves travel through that medium. The symbol N is used for the index of refraction, and V is the speed in the medium. And C is the speed of light in vacuum, which, oh, two U's, I think. Guys, vacuum is always one of those words that I spell wrong, so I hope I got it right there. V-A-C-C-U-V-A-C-U-U-M. We saw last class that that was three times 10 to the eighth meters per second. Okay. So when light enters a medium, it slows down, assuming it's coming from vacuum. Okay. But remember, we also have a formula that re relates wave speed, wavelength, and frequency. Okay. Well, if we go into a medium, the wave speed changes. So something else has to change as well. Otherwise, this formula for a wave will not hold, and it has to because this is valid for all waves. To help understand why what changes changes and why what doesn't change doesn't change here, I'm going to use a little story about ants. I don't know if you've ever watched ants, but ants like to walk along in a line. So here we got an ant, here we got another ant, right? and you get this whole trail of lines. Okay. I could measure the speed the ants are walking at and get that number. I could look at the distance between one ant and the other and get, that's an, a lambda, not an x, get the equivalent of a wavelength for the ants. Right. And I could time. How many ants go by in a given amount of time? That would give me my frequency. Okay. Well, up ahead of the ants, there is a wet spot, some mud. Right, so this is dry on this side, and it's muddy on this side, and the ants are going to just plow straight forward. Well, what happens? Well, when this first ant hits the mud, he slows down. So when we hit the mud, V decreases. Right? Well, if he slows down, that means this other guy is going to catch up to him, which means the distance between the ants has now decreased. Oh, that's a wrong thing. Let's try that again. Wavelength also decreases. But if I look in the mud and time how many ants go by in a given amount of time, I'm going to get the same number. They're moving slower, but they are closer together. Therefore, their frequency doesn't change. And the same is true for a wave. The wave speed changes when you move from medium to medium. The wavelength changes when you move from medium to medium, but the frequency is constant. Frequency of a wave does not change when it goes from medium to medium. We have at the top here a table of indices of refraction. Here is that table. Um, you can see vacuum up here at 1. Air at standard temperature and pressure is just a little bit different than one, but for all intents and purposes for this class, we're going to let the index of refraction in air be one. We got ice and water at 1.33. If we come down further, we get into the glasses at 1.5. And all the way at the bottom of the list is diamond at 2.417. Let's think about diamond for a minute. If I come over here, and have C equals NV. Speed of light in vacuum was 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. The index of diamond was 2.4. Yes, I know I'm rounding a little bit. 
and that's multiplied by the speed in the medium. So the speed of light in diamond is going to be 3 times 10. Oop, I'm writing this all in my calculator wrong. Let's try again. 3 times 10 to the 8th divided by 2.4. And that has a value of 1.25 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. So yes, it is still moving very fast, but it is not moving nearly as fast as it was when it was in vacuum. This table for indices of refraction is directly out of your textbook. When you work the homework problems, these are the numbers that you are going to need to answer the questions. So next, we're going to look at what happens when we move from medium to medium. And for that, we're going to look at this simulation. So here it is. For this simulation, the first thing I want to show you is that if we're staying in the same medium and I turn on the light source, the light just goes straight through. There's nothing reflected because really there's no boundary here. And it doesn't change direction because there's no change in medium. On the other hand, if we go from air into water, now I do have a surface I can reflect on. And if I pull up the protractor, put it in place, roughly, it's actually kind of hard to get there, but I think that's it. Um, we see that the incoming ray and the reflected ray do indeed follow the law of reflection. But now look at the angle of the refracted ray. Remember, we measure angles from the normal, so the incident angle is at 45 degrees. But the refracted ray is at closer to 30. We went from a low index medium air to a higher index medium water, and the angle decreased. It bent towards the normal, is what is often said. And the bigger the difference between the indices of refraction, the more it bends towards the normal. Okay, so now let's go back to being just in air and switch it around. Let's start in water in this case and now go into air. Again we see the ref reflected angle is the same as the incident angle but now look at the refracted ray. Instead of bending towards the normal we've bent away from the normal. If I increase the difference between the indices in this case we see that we refract further and further and further from the normal. Okay. In fact, there's a point here where the refracted ray goes away. Now all of our light is reflecting within the first medium and nothing is refracted into the second medium. This is known as total internal reflection. Several things in your daily life depend on this behavior. Fiber optics that are used to transmit um, high-speed internet and things like that rely on total internal reflection. And the sparkle in the gemstone in a, a ring or an earring is also due to total internal reflection. Let's back up a minute and put this back into water. Okay. And let's find the angle for which total internal reflection occurs going from water into air. And we see when we hit an angle at about 50 degrees, an incident angle of about 50 degrees, the refracted beam goes away. If I go back down just below 50, it reappears. Right, So right around 50 degrees. Keep that number in mind because shortly we will actually be able to calculate that. So at this point, Things that depend on the index of refraction and refraction is, um, again, a trick of your brain. 
your brain does not like to interpret light as changing direction. Thus why we see um, reflections in mirror behind the mirror instead of off to the side somewhere. The same thing happens when you look at something in water. So here we have an uh, illustration of a gentleman standing on the beach, a young lady standing in the water, and what really happens is light reflects off of her foot, hits the surface of the water, and then refracts into his eyes. But what does his brain interpret this as? He interprets it as a straight line. So really, he sees her foot at about the level of her knee. Okay, well now think about this. From the water line upward, she looks normal, if you will. But from the water line downward, her legs look really, really short. Very odd. Other things that fall under this same sort of phenomena is if you want to uh, go fishing with your hand and you see a fish, you don't want to aim where you see the fish, you actually want to aim beneath it for the exact same reason. He's deeper in the water than your brain thinks it is. Okay. So how do we actually go about these calculations? Well, we use something called Snell's Law. I'm going to let, uh, not this, I'm going to let this medium be N1. Why N1? Because it's where our incident light is. So I want to let the angle between the normal and the incident beam, in this case, be theta 1. Right. So what are we going to see here? Well, assuming we're not doing total internal reflection, we will get a reflected beam. So I'm going to call this theta R. And that, again, has to obey our law of reflection that we saw a couple of units ago. We also have to get a refracted beam. And since it's in the second medium, I'm going to call that theta 2. We also see that I have bent towards the normal here, so we should expect N1 to be bigger than N2. I can relate N1, N2, theta 1, and theta 2 to each other using Snell's Law. So N1 sine theta 1 equals N2 sine theta 2. Let's do a sample calculation where we determine the value of theta 2 based on what we know is happening with the incident angle and the indices. So let's let n1 equal 1, so we're in error. Let's let NT, n2 equal 1.5, so we're in roughly glass. And let's let this be roughly a 30 degree angle, which is not how it's drawn, but we're going to go with it anyway. Okay. So 1 times the sine of 30 degrees, ooh, that's a degree sine, equals, ooh, oh, apparently I wanted a parenthesis there. 1.5 times the sine of theta 2. Okay, so remember the sine of 30 degrees is 1 half, so this gives me 0 0.5 divided by 1.5 is the sine of theta 2. If I put that into my calculator, 0 0.5 divided by 1.5 has a value of 0 0.33. Now I have to take an inverse sine of both sides. So theta 2 is going to equal the inverse sine of 0 0.33. And that value is 19.33. Five degrees. Let's go check that on our simulation. So, oop, I missed. Where is my simulation? There it is. Okay, so we went from air, we just make it in air, to glass at 1.5. Our incident angle was 30 degrees, and our refracted angle is right around 20, 19.5. So that is consistent. Okay, so coming back over here. Okay. Again, we've already looked at this. Okay, what happens if? What happens if when we go from high index to low index, then we saw that the light refracted away from the normal, and there was this angle where you no longer got a refracted angle, or sorry, refracted light. Um, 
that angle is known as the critical angle and for any angle beyond the critical angle you only have reflected light. We can find the critical angle using Snell's law. So in this case theta 1 is going to be the critical angle because it's the angle of the incident beam in the first medium. And theta 2 is going to be 90 degrees. It's refracted right along the in the boundary between the two mediums. So if I attempt to draw this, here's my boundary between the two mediums. This is N1, this is N2. That's my normal. It's close to being straight. So I am putting light in here. This angle is theta critical. And then the refracted light is landing right on this boundary where that is a 90 degree angle. Okay. That means that the sine of theta critical is the ratio of the two um, indices of refraction. Now remember when we looked at the simulation, we looked specifically at what happened when our two indices were air and water. So air was on top, that makes it N1. Oh, I got that backward. Water was on top, so that makes it N1, which means I wrote this all upside down. So let's try again. There we go. Air is on the bottom. Okay. So 1 divided by 1.33 is 0 0.75. And now to find the critical angle, I take the inverse sine of that. And we get an answer of 48.8 degrees. And when we looked at the simulation, we saw that it happened right around 50 degrees. So again, consistent with the simulation. Now, there's more to the story because the index of refraction isn't just a single number. It actually is wavelength dependent. That's what this graph is showing you. Here we have three different measurements of the index of refraction of water taken by three different research groups. You can see down here at the red end of the spectrum, right around 700 nanometers, they have a value of about 1.33, which is the number that was specified in the tables before. But at the blue end of the spectrum, it's a bit higher, somewhere between 1.34 and 1.35. Okay. This is known as dispersion. It's the variation of the index of refraction based upon the wavelength of the light. For most materials, this sort of behavior where it's higher in the blue and lower in the red is typical. Okay. It's not always the case, but this is typical behavior. Okay. So again, dispersion is the variation of the index of refraction as a function of wavelength. Okay. Things that depend on dispersion are rainbows. So what happens to form a rainbow? We have white light, which is a combination of all the colors of light come in from the sun, it hits a raindrop. Because of dispersion, the refraction angle of the red and the violet are slightly different. Both beams reflect off the back of the um, water droplet, total internal reflection there. And then they hit the other edge of the uh, raindrop and refract back out but now the violet and the red are separated from each other. So from upper water droplets, the red is going to hit your eye, and from lower water droplets, the violet will hit your eye, which is why you see the red on top of the primary rainbow. On the other hand, if you were to look at the secondary rainbow, I drew it up above, the red is actually on the bottom, and the violet is on the top of the secondary rainbow. So when you see a double rainbow, the one on the bottom is the primary, the one on 
the top would be the secondary, and the colors are reversed. And the reason for that is there's an extra reflection on the back of the water droplet. So again, white light comes in, and instead of bouncing once in the back, you bounce twice and refract out. And that second reflection on the back of the water droplet causes the colors to reverse order. I'll leave it to you to Google an image of a um, secondary rainbow so that you can actually see that's what's happening. Please make sure when you do this you, you find a real picture and not one that was photoshopped. They are out there, trust me. Okay, Other things that depend on dispersion. If I again can pull up my simulation and we go and look at prisms. So here I have a prism. I'm going to put white light into it. Turn it on. So white light comes in and it refracts in here and refracts on the way out and because of those two refractions and the dispersion going into glass and then back out of glass the light becomes separated into its constituent colors. I could make it a single color and then we could watch as the angles change. Okay, so back over here again. This is the table from your book for the variation of the index of refraction as a function of wavelength. Again, if you are going to, um, if you need a number for a homework problem, this is the table you need to look at. 